My sister Sally was staying at my apartment for a few days while her husband Benjamin was on a business trip. They'd only been married for less than a year, so she missed him a lot. I tried to cheer her up, but she kept thinking about Benjamin. On her first morning here, I decided to surprise her with donuts. There was a Dunkin' Donuts on the other side of town, so I drove there before Sally woke up. It was pretty far, but I knew that Dunkin' was her favorite. I went up to the counter and ordered a half dozen for us to share. I wanted to hurry back before Sally woke up, so I was in kind of a rush. It wasn't until after I gave the cashier my money that I noticed two people sitting in the back of the restaurant. When I turned to look, I was shocked to see it was Benjamin and some woman I would never met before. Benjamin was looking away, trying to hide his face, but I knew it was him. He should have been out of town on his business trip. The only explanation I could think of was that he lied to my sister. He was cheating on her. I paid the woman and walked right over to their table. I asked Benjamin what he was doing there, and he said that he and his co-worker had dropped in to pick up some donuts for his work conference. I knew that was a bull-faced lie. They only had two donuts, one each, and both were already half-eaten. The woman he was with instantly turned red when she heard him lie to me. I guess that was the moment she realized that they've been caught. I was furious. Sally loved her husband more than anything, and knew that she wouldn't believe me if I told her the truth. So, I pulled out my phone and snapped a photo of the two of them sitting together. I didn't say anything else. I turned around and walked back to the counter, where my box of donuts was waiting for me. I grabbed them and hurried out of the restaurant. Benjamin shouted, Wait! as I left, but I didn't stop. I got into my car and just sat there for a long moment, trying to collect my thoughts. I knew that as soon as I got back home, I'd have to break the news to Sally, but I really didn't want to do that. I turned on the ignition and drove out of the parking lot. Once I got onto the street, I noticed that Benjamin's car was following me. He must have rushed out of the restaurant without me noticing. The roads were pretty empty at this time of morning, and his beat-up Nissan was the only other car on the road. He wasn't even trying to hide the fact that he was following me. He was speeding, and for a second, it felt like he was going to run me off the road. I sped up and so did he. We were both driving really fast. He started honking and flashing his lights. He wanted me to pull over. I didn't know Benjamin that well, but he always seemed like a calm, slightly boring guy. I'd never seen this side of him before. I'd also never been involved in a car chase before, and I was terrified. I felt my whole body jerk forward as he slammed into the back of my car. I lost control and skidded off the road. In less than a second, I crashed into a tree. It happened so fast, I didn't feel any pain but I guess I blacked out. When I came to, I was stuck behind an airbag. I couldn't see anything, and I felt my face throb. My nose had been broken on impact. I heard voices at my side, and I knew that it was Benjamin and that woman. Is she dead? I heard Benjamin say, I sure hope so. I felt his hand reach into my pocket and pull out my phone. He was deleting the photo that I'd taken. Then I heard a crunch and could only assume that he'd taken my phone and smashed it. What if she's still alive? Her voice sounded much more concerned than his. I couldn't tell if she was upset about what they'd done or just about the possibility of getting caught. Then I heard him comfort her and say that he'd handle the situation. After that, I felt Benjamin's hands grab my arm as he tried to pull me out of the wreckage. I was aching all over and I knew I didn't have the strength to fight him off. The only thing I could do was pretend to be dead as he pulled me out of the wreckage and then try to run off before he could kill me. I felt excruciating pain all through my body as he pulled me out and threw me onto the ground. It took all my mental strength to keep my eyes closed and pretend that I was already dead. I laid on the ground completely motionless as Benjamin told the woman that he'd be right back. He needed to get a rock. Now. I could hear the woman starting to cry. She was muttering something to herself, but I couldn't make out the words. I knew that this was my only chance to escape. Moving as fast as I could, I pushed myself off the ground and started limping back toward the road. Thankfully, the woman didn't try to grab me, but she screamed and got Benjamin's attention. 
I looked over my shoulder and saw him racing toward me as I sped up. There was a pretty steep incline along the edge of the road, and it was hard for me to keep going. One of my ankles was probably broken. Just as I reached the asphalt, Benjamin grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me back. I toppled down the incline and landed painfully on my broken ankle. I was in so much pain I could barely breathe. Benjamin stood over me and asked, Why do you have to take that photo? I tried to beg him to let me go, but no words came out. I tasted blood filling my mouth. Don't move, he said. It'll be easier that way. I watched in horror as he picked up a rock and raised it over his head. He was going to drop it right on my face. It was huge. It would have killed me instantly. I lost all hope. I knew that these were my last moments on earth. But before he could do it, the woman ran towards us and tackled Benjamin to the ground. The rock fell with a thud. Let me do this. Benjamin shouted in her face. If she lives, we're both going down. But people are watching? The woman said. Slowly, I raised my head and looked back toward the street. Several drivers had gotten out of their cars and were looking down on us from the sidewalk. They saw what Benjamin was trying to do. One of them was filming the whole thing on his phone. Without saying anything, Benjamin ran away, leaving the woman behind. The woman slowly raised both her hands, as if she was about to be arrested. I don't know what happened after that because I passed out from the pain. I woke up in the hospital. I must have been on some pretty strong pain medication because I was tingly all over. Sally sat next to my bed, but when she saw that I was awake, she jumped up. Are you okay? I think so. Sally told me that Benjamin was still missing. The police were looking for him, and it was only a matter of time before he was caught. The woman he was with had already been arrested. Then, Sally started crying and said she was so sorry that her husband had done this to me. I told her it wasn't her fault. Sally grabbed the paper bag and pulled out a single donut. Here. This will make you feel better. I was so happy to be alive. I ate that donut in seconds. It was the best donut I'd ever eaten. I had just started my new job as a secretary for a mid-sized insurance company, and it wasn't going well. On my first day, I printed out the wrong packet for my boss Jonah's presentation, and he yelled at me in front of everyone. He said that if I made another mistake, I'd be fired. My coworkers told me that he usually wasn't this aggressive. Something must have happened in his personal life. I didn't care what his reason was, though. I didn't want to get on his bad side. For the rest of the week, Jonah watched me like a hawk. It was like he was waiting for me to screw up again. I needed to do something to get on his good side. I noticed that he often picked up Dunkin' Donuts for breakfast, so I decided that I'd go and pick up a dozen donuts for the office as a surprise. So, Friday morning, I got up early and headed to Dunkin' around 6.30. They had just opened and everything was really fresh. I ordered a dozen, making sure I got a couple maple bars. Those are the ones that Jonah always ordered. The cashier was a young girl who seemed really nice. Her name tag said Hannah. She packed everything up and we talked for a little bit. I told her how stressed I was at my new job, and she commensurated with me. She talked about how she just got out of a pretty bad relationship with a married man, but her life was much better now. As she handed me the order, she noticed the work uniform I was wearing, and her face instantly dropped. That's where you work? It seemed like she knew something that I didn't, but when I asked her what was wrong, she handed me my donuts and told me not to worry. As I walked out of the restaurant, I saw Jonah pulling into the parking lot. I didn't want to ruin the surprise, so I ducked behind a car before he could see me. I watched him walk inside, then I got in my car and drove straight to the office. Jonah ended up coming in an hour late. By then, most of the donuts had already been eaten, but I made sure to save one of the maple bars just in case. For some reason, he seemed completely different. He was smiling and whistling to himself like a huge weight had been lifted off his shoulders. 
The rest of the workday was pretty uneventful. My donut surprise didn't seem to impress Jonah at all, but he was still in a much better mood than before. He even thanked me when I gave him his mail. That night, I was watching the local news when I saw a report on a murder victim that had been found earlier in the day. They showed a picture of the girl, and it took me a second to recognize that it was Hannah, the girl from the donut shop. They said that her body had been found in a dumpster behind the restaurant. She had been murdered that morning, and the police had no leads. Whoever killed her had shut off the restaurant's security cameras. They were asking the public for any witnesses to come forward. I felt absolutely terrible. I might have been one of the last people to see her alive. I remember that Jonah was there too. Maybe he'd seen something. I thought about telling him that night, but I decided to wait until the morning. When I got to the office the next day, I could see Jonah was just as cheerful as he was the day before. It seemed like a good time to talk to him about Hannah, to see if he had any information that might be able to help the police. It was the two of us alone in his office. I asked him if he saw the news, and he said no. Then I admitted that I had seen him entering Dunkin' Donuts right after me. I asked him if he remembered the woman who was working there. His expression instantly went blank. He knew something about her murder. I tried to ask him what he knew, but he refused to tell me. Instead, he asked if I had talked to police yet. I shook my head no. I didn't have any specific information to give them, but maybe I had seen something important without realizing it. Jonah suggested that we both go to the police station together. I was glad that he seemed to be taking it as seriously as I did. He quickly got out of his chair and marched towards the elevators. I hurried to catch up. He said that we could both take our lunch early and we'd be back within the hour. He still wouldn't say what he knew about Hannah though. We rode the elevator for a couple floors before I realized that Jonah had pushed the wrong button. We weren't heading to the ground floor. We were headed toward the roof. I asked him what was going on and he said he just had a short errand to do first. He didn't say anything else. When the elevator door opened, he pulled me out onto the roof before I could push him away. By this point, I could see the insanity in his eyes. He was unhinged. He had just taken me to a place where no one could see or hear us. He reached back into the elevator and pushed all the buttons, so that if I tried to go back down, I'd have to wait a long time before the elevator reached us. Jonah looked around to make sure no one else was nearby, and then he finally came clean. He said he'd been seeing Hannah for months. That's why he went to Dunkin' Donuts. Even though he was married, he had fallen madly in love with Hannah. When she rejected him, he couldn't stand it, so he murdered her and disposed of the body. I was disgusted. What he was saying and how he was saying it, he was smiling. He was proud of himself. And as he talked, he slowly stepped closer to me. I had to back away from him. What are you doing? I asked. He got even closer, his face inches from mine. There weren't supposed to be any witnesses. He growled at me. You killed her? I asked. He didn't answer, but his dark smile told me everything. He looked proud, triumphant. Then his expression dropped. I'm so sorry. You were actually one of our best employees. He reached forward, ready to push me off the building. I wish I'd gotten to know you better, he said. Then he slammed into my chest, expecting me to fall backwards, but I didn't. If he had gotten to know me, he would have known that I had been taking Taekwondo classes for over a decade. At the last second, I grabbed him by the wrists and twisted my body to the side. He didn't have enough time to stop, so without me in front of him, he toppled forward and fell over the edge. After two terrible seconds of silence, I heard him splat on the ground far below. I looked down and saw his body lying dead on the parking lot. His head was twisted all the way around. When the police came, I explained everything step by step. They didn't believe me at first, but when one of the officers unlocked his phone, 
You saw photos of Jonah and the Dunkin' Donuts girl together. That was the evidence they needed to let me go. Though, they still said they'd call me again if they needed more information. This all happened about a week ago. I'm still at the same company, and without Jonah as my boss, I'm starting to really like my job. People love to preach to me about how much money I could save if I stopped buying coffee so regularly. I tell them, look, it's in the budget and I'm lazy, so to Dunkin' Donuts I will go. And I'm just saying that Dunkin' is relatively cheap compared to their competitors. All the workers at my local Dunkin' know my order. There are still times when they get my drink wrong, but mistakes happen. Especially when you're in that drive-thru as much as me, there's bound to be a mess up once in a while. You could think getting the wrong order is the worst thing that could happen to you in the drive-thru, but it's not like that. A couple of weeks ago, I was on my way to work and stopped to get a coffee. The line was unusually long that day. Cars snaked around the entire building and stretched through the parking lot. There was only one space for one car before the line started to peek into the main road. Looking at the line, I knew it would make me late to work. It wouldn't have been my first time late because I was getting coffee. Sometimes I sneak in and no one notices, but this time, since the line was so long, I texted my manager that I was running late. I told her I would make it up to her and the team by bringing all of us donuts. She said, okay, but don't be too late. We have a meeting at 9.30. I pulled into the line and got as close to the car in front of me as possible. My small sedan fit perfectly in the amount of space left in the parking lot. I was surprised a car tried to pull it behind me because they would be sticking out into traffic. It was a massive black truck, and instead of four wheels, it had six because it had double back wheels. He pulled up behind me and laid on his horn. I looked in my rearview mirror and he motioned for me to move up. I turned around and tried to mouth politely, I can't, and shrugged at him. In response, he laid on his horn for longer. Still turned around and looking at him, I was in disbelief. He revved his engines and made the same hand motion, instructing me to move forward. I shook my head at him and turned forward. The line was bound to start moving here soon. The man continued to honk and rev his engine. What was he going to do? Run me over in the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot? He saw that there was no room for his car, but he still chose to get in line. It's not my fault he's sticking out into traffic. Finally, the line moved forward, and all the cars pulled forward, leaving enough room for this man to pull into the parking lot. You would think this would be the end of his antics, but... No, the guy continued to rev his engines behind me and honk at me. He started to yell at me, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. It became so obnoxious I flipped him off. He really didn't like that and revved up his engine in response. I wanted to tell him to chill out. The line kept moving. The guy kept egging me on. I was confused about what he thought he was accomplishing. Anyway, I reached the front of the line, paid for my items, and was happy to get away from that guy. I pulled out into the street and started to drive away. It wasn't long before I checked my rearview mirror and saw the massive truck tailing me. One of my friends had a road rage incident that ended with him getting stabbed, so I was nervous to drive straight to work. Would he return around the end of the business day? Would he try and jump me if I got out of my car? At a stoplight, I texted my manager what was happening and she gave me a pass on our morning meeting. I drove around for another 30 minutes and this guy never let up. Sometimes, he'd switch lanes when we would come to a stoplight to glare at me while he revved his engine. After another 15 minutes, he finally took a turn and I lost him. Once I couldn't see him, I headed to work. Throughout the day, I couldn't stop thinking of him. He was so persistent and aggressive. I kept going over how it wasn't my fault there wasn't room in the parking lot for his car. I was pulled forward as far as possible, but he still got so angry. When I went to leave for the day, I heard the rev of an engine and jumped. I scanned the parking lot for the back truck, but it turned out to be my coworker starting his car. The entire ride home, I kept checking the rearview mirror for the truck. One car seemed to be following me, but he took a turn at some point, so I assumed I was just shaken up from the morning. The rest of my day was normal. I went along like I usually do. I made dinner, watched some TV, and then went to bed. Around 2 a.m., I woke up to the sound of a revving engine. I got out of bed to look out my window and the truck was there, parked in front of my home. He 
was flashing his brights and revving his engine. Not sure of what to do, I called the police. They said, since he hasn't done anything directly to you, there's not much we can do, but we will send some guys there to get him off your back. When the police rolled up, the guy sped off. I went out and told the police what happened, but again, they told me there wasn't much they could do unless a crime had been committed. I thought that would be the last I saw of him, but it wasn't. He returned the next three nights just revving his engines and flashing his brights. I called the police each night and was told the same thing. He stayed out there for hours. I had no idea how none of my neighbors called to file a complaint. After the fifth night, I decided I had enough. It seemed like all he wanted to do was scare me, but he wouldn't do anything to harm me. Like he was all talk and no walk. I called the police to see if they could send someone to shoo him off, and they said yes. Since I knew the police were coming, I went outside to confront him. I walked onto my driveway and yelled, What is your problem? He stopped revving his engine. He opened his door and stepped out. He was a big, bald man wearing a thick leather jacket. In his right hand, he held a baseball bat. You are everything I hate about women. He sneered and started towards me. He called me a bitch and yelled other bitches at me. I retreated back into my house immediately when I saw the baseball bat. He trudged up to my front door and started pounding on it. I was scared he was going to break it down. It was stupid of me to think confronting him was a good idea. He went to the window beside the front door and used the bat to shatter it. I ran to the kitchen to grab a knife. I kept telling myself the police would be here any second. He slowly stomped through the house. I sat on the floor of the kitchen holding the biggest knife I had, praying the police would show up. As he was about to turn the corner into my kitchen, red and blue flashing lights filled my home. I thought I was in the clear, but this made the man speed up. He whipped around the corner into the kitchen, grabbed me by my hair, and lifted me from the floor, causing me to drop the knife. You annoying little b he growled. The police ran in, armed with guns. They demanded he let me go. Since all he had was a baseball bat, he listened. They put him in handcuffs and took him away. The cops gave me his information so I could get a restraining order just in case he ever tried anything again. They told me the road rage incidents can get out of hand, but this was the worst they've ever seen. I never saw that black truck again, but I pray for the next person who flips him off. The thrill of being trapped alone in my own world, away from the general bustle of the gym, made me go faster on the treadmill. I had my eyes trailing the city outside with the full-length glass that showed a whole city sprawled from the base of the gym to the far ends of the ocean shores. What my eyes saw stimulated my senses. The music in my head proved useful company. Jarring reverberations that enlivened every muscle in my body to bursting life. I could deal with the agitation. It gave me fuel, cozied me away from all my troubles. Every pore of my body burst with sweat, sweet juices from running so fast and enduring such an intense routine. It was not my first time, and somewhere in the back of my head I knew it would not be my last. Four, three, two... I mouthed as I counted down to the end of my intense lap, and at the end of my countdown, I tapped on the screen of the machine. The sliding floors of the machine slowed down and so did my pace. I caught my breath and exhaled powerfully when I decelerated to a manageable jog. I had been so focused on my work that it only took me slowing down to notice from the corner of my eyes that someone had been staring at me from quite a distance. Instinctively, I turned in his direction. There he was, a full-grown man like a child, ginger-haired and chubby with a tall plastic cup of soda in his hand. He had on a gray shirt with a sweaty patch around the neck and some of the sweat under both of his arms. His eyes were heavy and they stared from under even heavier brows. Naked vulnerability in the middle of the gym did not deter his attention from me, and I felt a sickly feeling running through me from being under the crooked, uncontrollable gaze of this man. I was startled by the audacity of the episode, and quickly I turned away. Weirdo, 
I muttered when I stepped off the platform of the treadmill. I took a few steps towards the more populated area of the dumbbells. I sighted the eight kilogram bars and I sauntered towards it after brief smiles at the more familiar faces in the gym. I sat on the bench with both the dumbbells on each side of me and straightened out my back. Naturally, my eyes went up again and again. There he was, now without the plastic cup of drink, just staring at me. My stomach sank and I immediately had an awry feeling about him. I bent over to lift, but sheer frustration wore my arms out. Fuck, I cussed, knowing I was done for the day because a man who did not know his place in the gym or around it decided to ruin it for me. I thought of walking up to him immediately and shoving my fingers in his face to inquire why he stared at me in such a way, but that was a bad idea. It was a terrible thing to have a creep on one's tail. It was worse to have a creep with a motive. I slipped my headset backwards and again, I was off in the world of the gym, just like everyone else. I peeled the patch off my hand gloves and pulled them off. When my head came back up, he was gone. I gasped and my sense of wariness immediately kicked into a frenzy. My eyes roamed around the gym briefly, and not a sign of him was found anywhere around the wide expanse of the gym. My heart kicked back into the same rhythm that I had during my run. The problem was that I wasn't running, so it was all a nasty sensation in my chest. I set out for my bag immediately, with conflicting thoughts of distraction. I offered a small prayer that the strange feeling was all a mistake and that nothing untoward happened towards me. I slinged my bag over my shoulders and made my way to exit the building. The sun outside had started to come out in its glory, and as strangely aware of my circumstance, I could still appreciate the fine day it was with the mild heat burning on the skin. I pulled out my car keys and squeezed. <coughs> my car squealed. I hesitated. Damn. It had been so natural to me that I hadn't realized the mistake until I had done it. If the ginger-haired creep was in the parking lot waiting on me, now he surely knew where my car was. The fact that I did not know what to expect made me sick. It manifested in all parts of my body as my skin soon started to splotch. My fingers also shook violently and when I tried to speak, I noticed I couldn't do so without gasping. I stepped gently towards the maze of cars, looking over my shoulders the entire time to be sure I wasn't followed and I gasped a sigh of relief when I reached my car. I placed my hands on the hinge, a red chubby hand clasped my hand over the hinge and gripped me tightly. I've got a knife to the side of your stomach, and I will spill your guts if you so much as think of screaming, he said. And even though I had never heard him speak up until that point, I knew it was him. Please, I begged, dripping in perspiration as the sharp tip of the knife poked into my belly. I was dizzy, and all my senses went into distemper. My vision was blurry, and the feeling of sun on my skin faded to the point when I was numb, I could only beg. His presence behind me grew larger, as though my offering of pleas served to unravel his appetite. How about I skin you and splay you all over the concrete of this gym parking lot? He asked, and I had no doubts that was what he intended to do. I could already picture the headlines in my head. The gore of it was repulsive. It was not the way I wished to go. I stifled my scream. I'm gonna kill you, stupid piece of shit. He spoke with venom. He flicked his arm and just as I felt his arm move around me with the knife, which he intended to poke first and then drag along, he suddenly stopped. I heard another gun draw. Your hands where I can see them. A strange female voice said seemingly out of the blue. The ginger haired man unwound for me quickly and he tossed the knife to the ground as he complied. I turned around wheezing breathlessly and there were cops behind us in the parking lot, and one of the staff of the gym was standing behind them. Are you okay, miss? The staff asked as the cop swooped in to do his job. I saw your entire interaction with him, and I knew I had to call the cops. Are you okay? He asked again. I nodded. Even though I was not okay, and I had just had the most horrifying few moments of my life in the gym parking lot, I was grateful to still have my life as they walked the crazed ginger-haired man away from me in cuffs.